can feel the weather change you. You know, it's in the air. You feel the the chill. You know, the slight crispness that causes the leaves to no longer seek to blossom, but rather they begin to pull back. The sap no longer flows up the tree and out the limbs to the twigs and the twigs to the leaves and then from the leaves to the veins of the leaf, you know, and then it begins to pull backwards. And as it does, the green leaves change to golden brown as they no longer do the photosynthesis, but rather pull back and pull into themselves back to the life-giving sap that keeps the tree alive, that is like the blood veins in our system that sometimes we too need to recognize that there's a season to our life that we pull back. We need to take the time to sit back, to evaluate, you know, what we're doing, where we've come from, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. You know, I have been so blessed by God so many times in my life that, you know, I have had little and owned very little and possessed not much, but what I had, I enjoyed phenomenally. And many times people have seen that as being, wow, you are blessed. You know? Where other people say, wow, you were poor. And I laugh because, you know, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, you know. God really does give you something of a blessing if you are poor. But you get to experience things that other people don't see and maybe they don't know. And I know that sounds a little prejudicial, but it's true. It's just a fact of what God said. You know, Jesus taught us, you know, in a way that maybe isn't quite the American dream, you know, because I know that in America most people want to achieve and get rather than give, you know, and be less. And you know, in the ministry, that's kind of an interesting dichotomy because on the one hand you want to spread out and reach out and try to tell as many people as you can but the funny thing is Jesus didn't do that he spoke and people came to him he did miracles people came to him but then he would say things that would drive people away from him <laughs> he wasn't Mr. Nice Guy you know he said things that they said people went ah no, I'm sorry you know I can't handle you no more you know that was that was good up to a point, but now you now you cross the line. You know, I've had it. You know, I'm gone. And Jesus is going to do that to you at times. You know, you're going to run into a place where you have to make a decision of which way you'll go. You know, will you be more carnal? Will you be more prosperity oriented? Will you be more ministerial and not with the poor people? Will you be more worldly and not spiritual? You know, will you be more carnal and not godly? The choice is yours because, quite frankly, in grace, there's a lot of liberality, but there's a big consequence to the choices you do make. You know, for me, I, I would consider well, you know, as today I'm being asked to ask for what I want, you know, and I know God would give me just about anything that I desired, but the older I've gotten, the less I want, you know, it's... Gradually, I've given away the things that I possessed, and that possessed me, so that way I could be free to be his possession, his choice vessel, to be directed as he chooses, even as the wind's blowing from the north right now and blowing the trees around. You know, you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. You know, my life has always been like that. Though I've been confined these last few years in one location, you know, I feel that yearning, you know, to be back on the road again. You know, sometimes going where you do not know, or to do what you don't know how you're going to do, and to have that feeling of oh, angst and anxiousness, but anticipation of seeing how God's going to work it out. Sometimes that's challenging. Sometimes it's scary. But you know what? It's called being alive, and it's, it's a good feeling when you know you're a Christian and you know that God is with you. Because then you don't fear, really, what the end result will be, because in the end you win. <laughs> but today, many times there are divisions in the body of Christ. As you look around and you see people kind of like wanting something that someone else has, or someone else is doing it. Be careful of that. You know, don't get caught up in the numbers. Don't get deceived by the 
perspectives. Don't go into things that you don't know what or how you should do it if God hasn't told you to. Because without the Lord leading, you're going to stumble and fall. But if God gives you something, enjoy it for what he's given it for. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. John 16:24. During the Civil War, a man who had an only son who enlisted in the armies of the Union, and the father was a banker, and though he consented to his son's going, it seemed as if it would break his heart to let him go. He became deeply interested in the soldier's boys, and whenever he saw a uniform, his heart went out as though he was his own dear son. He spent his time, neglected his business, and gave his money to the caring of soldiers, who came home invalid. His friends remonstrated him, with him saying he had no right to neglect his business and spent so much thought upon the soldiers so he fully decided to give it all up. After he had come to his decision there stepped into his bank one day a private soldier in a faded worn uniform who showed in his face and hands the mark of the hospital. This poor fellow was fumbling in his pocket to get something or other when the banker saw him and perceiving his purpose said to him my dear fellow I cannot do anything for you today I am extremely busy You'll have to go to your headquarters, and the officers there will look after you. Still, the poor convalescent stood, not seeming to fully understand what was said to him. Still, he fumbled in his pockets, and by and by, drew out a scrap of dirty paper, on which there was a few lines with a pencil, and laid in his soiled sheet before the banker. On it, he found these words. Dear Father, this is one of my comrades who was wounded in the last fight, and has been in the hospital. Please receive him as myself, Charlie. In a moment, all the resolutions of indifference which this man had fled away. He took the boy to his palatial home, put him in Charlie's room, and gave him Charlie's seat at the table, and kept him until food and rest and love had brought him back to hell. And then he sent him back again into a perilous life for the flag. Now shalt thou see what I will do, Exodus 6 1. You know, there's often a time where we don't realize how much God has taken our place for what we have done that he has sacrificed himself and his life for the price of what our stupidity was and our sin. There comes a time when you must take stock of how selfish or how righteous you think you are. And stand before a holy God and look him in the eye and ask not for yourself what you would give, but what you could do for someone else to allow them to go to the place where you have already been. That you would stand like Moses in the gap and say, God forbid that you should wipe out the children of Israel but rather blot my name out of the book of life, that they might live. I don't know that any of us really can get to that place. I know at times I've been there, and at times I return there, but... Can we honestly say that we really care that much about someone else, that we would risk eternal damnation? for their eternal salvation. The older I get, the less I think so. For I recognize in me the sinner that I am and how desperately I need grace. And how much more so I see, <laughs> oh, in the ministry, so many more that are in desperate need of God's grace. That I think by comparison to eternal damnation, how sad it would be for any of them to find themselves without Jesus on the day of judgment. God forbid that we would so think of ourselves in such a way that we don't grieve over the loss of others, whether they be our friends, our enemies, our neighbors, our relatives, or someone that we thought we hated. Then you realize that compared to eternal damnation, do you really want them to die? Would you really condemn them to hell for eternity?
Seasons change. So do you, and so do I. And God can change our hearts. Not just to make us more willing to lay down our lives for others, but He can change their hearts that they would come to salvation through Him. For what begins with God ends with God. But we can heavily influence that by begging and pleading to God that He should save those loved ones that we know are dying without Him. If you have a loved one, or you've lost one, and for some reason you have this phony idea that there is no hell and there is no damnation, just because you didn't do what Jesus wanted you to do and you have some guilt complex that you don't want to think about there being a God of love who would send someone to hell. I'm telling you straight, straight from the Holy Spirit. Hell exists. And there are people that were created that have chosen not to follow Jesus Christ that wind up in hell and die. And will suffer eternity separated from God in a punishment that was designed for Satan and all his angels. And because they rebel against what they knew to be God, they too have followed Satan into that damnation forever. And it wasn't your fault. But what is your fault is if you try to change the Word of God to fit your idea of God, then you're failing what God wants you to do, which is to learn from the damnation of someone so that you would offer yourself for the salvation of someone else. Too many now are trying to make hell not exist. And too many are going to find out that they'll be sent to hell for trying to do so. Don't get caught up in heresies and fallacies and false theologies just because you want to make it easy for someone to follow Jesus. No. Don't try to change heaven into earth. But rather, let's try to let Jesus rule and reign in the salvation that he gave us. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and so he believed in him, would not perish if, if, and should not perish. They would believe in him with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength. And it's not about how good they do or how wonderful they are, it's about what Jesus has done, and what he's accomplished for them, and what he will do with them that they can't do for themselves. That is salvation. And it's not of works. But it is grace. And it doesn't apply to you.